Welcome to our Teaching in Troubled Times series event. Um, it's great to see so many folks here um, for this wonderful um, conversation and panel. Um, I will let our panelists and moderator um, talk more about today, but um, I am here just to welcome you to the, the whole series of Teaching in Troubled Times, which we've been running now for a couple of years. It's co-hosted and sponsored by the Division of Equity and Inclusion, where I work, the American Culture Center, this space, the Academic Innovation Studio, and the Center for Teaching and Learning. So on behalf of our full team, um, I welcome you. Um, my name is Amy Scharf. I work in the Division of Equity and Inclusion. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the organizers. So um, the series, as I said, has been running for a couple of years. We've run, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around a dozen different topics on um, various things related to um, kind of the current political context and equity issues, justice, diversity, inclusion. Um, and they're all run in a similar format. We have a few panelists who kick off the conversation and then we open for dialogue. It will be participatory today. Um, and I'm just gonna point you to, um, um, our, can you go to the top so people can see where it is? So there is um, a website that we've been posting um, resources and descriptions of all of our sessions. Um, you can Google Teaching in Troubled Times, UC Berkeley, and you should find it. And there is uh, information available on those. So There's plenty of food. Um, please feel free to eat as um, you need and take care of yourself if you need to do so. And I will turn the rest of it over to, um, we'll start with Sue Schweik, our moderator, and uh, Sue will introduce the whole event. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? okay? Please let me know if you can't hear me or anybody as the day goes on, um, or if there's anything else that you need altered as we go to make sure that everybody's getting access to this. I want to just start very quickly uh, by acknowledging a few things and then um, introducing the panel. I uh, want to start out with a land acknowledgement. I want to um, recognize that we're sitting on the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo Ohlone. Uh, and by saying that, that we're affirming indigenous sovereignty and our sense that we are working uh, together to hold this campus more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. And those issues are completely connected to the issues we're discussing today, which we may talk more about. Um, and I wanna thank the Native American Student Development Office for um, their land acknowledgement, which I took a little from. Um, second thing is, I wanna acknowledge just, I'm looking around, I find this very exciting, just the, um, the well of knowledge that's already in this room around this issue among the people who are here. And to start out with um, the people from the Disabled Students Program. So somewhere back there, uh, I think I saw Martha Velasquez and Carol and Swalina. Um, if you could just indicate where you are and they're in the very back of the room. Um, Danny Codmer is up here in the front. And if there are other people who are involved with um, official positions that somehow name disability. Could you let us know right now? Thank you. So, so please, these are people who, um, who are going to be resources for us today as well and who are always resources. Um, the other thing I wanna say is uh, there are uh, neck loops for um, hearing access if you need it. Um, we're gonna be doing uh, <coughs> some small group talking, uh, which you're perfectly free not to participate in, but also some writing. And so if you communicate some other way than writing, we have a phone number uh, that you can text or uh, and use voice, voice, you know, voice messaging. Uh, and that is 510-603-1481. That's 510-603. 1481, and please let me know, I can repeat that anytime. And please, uh, again, let us know if there's any issue that comes up that will help you uh, hear us, see us, um, get access to this event. If you need to stand up, lie down, um, 
leave <laughs> anytime. Go right, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> um, and finally, I get to introduce the, the panelists today. I'm Susan Schweik, by the way. I'm an English professor. Um, we have five panelists. And uh, let's see if I can do it from the, the ones who have been here the longest to <laughs> most recent. So definitely the longest is Marcia Saxton, who uh, is a very long time disability activist, bioethicist. Um, we were just talking about the revolutionary Our Bodies Ourselves, which Marcia very early on intervened in to make sure that wow. disabled women's health was represented in that text. Um, many decades of activist and a advocacy work, and Marcia's been teaching um, disability studies on our campus for, it's pretty close to s several decades. 25 years. 25 years. <laughs> it has passed several decades. Um, next, I think, in, I pr it's between Mel and Georgina. Uh, I'm not sure. Who I'll go with Mel. Mel, Mel uh, Chen is a uh, gender and professor in gender and women's studies and um, an extremely influential thinker and leader in disability studies. I would say especially around issues of uh, disability justice, racism, um, non-visible illness, um, and the conjunction of all those things. Um, Georgina Klieg. Here on my left is an English professor and a founding leader and nationally in the field of disability studies. I think was involved with maybe the very first, at least in the discipline, or for some reason became a, a kind of galvanizing home for disability studies um, in the humanities and in literature departments. Georgina was involved at the very start. Again, decades of work, especially on, but not only on um, issues to do with blindness and visuality and the arts, um, fascinatingly, uh, and the visual arts, arts that tend to be seen, painting and dance. Um, and more recently still, Karen Nakamura, our um, signal flagship higher in the field of disability studies <laughs> um, in our senior endowed chair search in the field. Uh, Karen Nakamura is an anthropologist and um, has written on almost any topic imaginable in the field, um, including an amazing book on um, independent living and psychiatric disability, a disability of the soul, it's also a film, but also on deaf issues, on robotics and prosthetics, and on um, many other issues. Um, and last but not least, Ella Callow, who we are so lucky to have Ella Callow now as our ADA compliance officer, and you will see what I mean very soon. Uh, Ella is a lawyer and a, a a scholar, a historical and, and legal scholar, and um, worked for many years on issues connected to um, disabled parents' right to have and keep their children. Um, and many, much of that time, if not all, um, not only around US national law, but tribal law and the intersection between those two things. And um, so I will um, stop there, and I'm going to turn you over to Marsha, who is going to start us off with a, a little um, uh, immersive exercise. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marsha Saxton. How's the sound? Good. Um, I, I teach uh, part-time introductory courses to disability studies. Um, I have a class right now with 50 students, 21 of whom have DSB accommodations. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that. The, the title of this program today is Beyond Accommodation, but we're going to start with just accommodations. And what we're going to do right now is dive in, and you'll understand in a moment why we're doing this right now first, is we want to get your 
concerns, problems, dif difficulties around accommodating students with disabilities as well as faculty and staff, just accommodation in general. So the burning question is, what's difficult for you if you have some difficulties? And we want real difficulties because we want to get to the crux of the issues. So what's hard? And we're going to sort through the questions and pick out the ones that we think might be applicable to the majority. But we want you to understand, and with the um, DSP uh, staff represented, that we want to hear all of your questions and concerns. It's important that you get to say what's hard. And um, we do this kind of thing. And in, uh, in my intro course, we just did a class on sexuality. And I did this passed out cards and pages saying, well, you know, what are your burning questions about sexuality and disability? Because students feel awkward about asking the questions for all the reasons why we're here. It's, it's um, confusing and difficult and maybe a little bit scary to go ahead and ask those basic questions. So please be bold. And we're going to pass your cards forward and address them as best we can. Thanks. And we're going to take 10 minutes for this. So if you're a very fast uh, dealer with your difficulties, you can go get some more food. <laughs> OK, how are we doing? All right, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. And we'll come back to those. Um, so we're going to start out with a few people just uh, framing some issues for us, um, starting with Ella Kella. Is that is the mic catching it hello everybody can hear me okay all right thank you everyone so much for being here we really really appreciate it. it's wonderful to look out and see uh, this large of a group engaged on an issue that we all value so deeply um, I am the 504 ADA compliance officer um, that is not what I'm here to talk about compliance so you're welcome uh, <laughs> kind of boring. Um, <laughs> I'm here to talk about the human rights movement that you participate in every single day when you arrive on this campus. We're on hollowed ground for the disability movement worldwide when we're here. Um, how many of you are familiar with the independent living movement and its ties to UC Berkeley? All right, good. That's awesome. That's more than usual. <laughs> um, the independent living movement is one of the most breathtakingly successful civil and human rights movements in the world. And this was ground zero for pushbacks against the eugenics movement in this country. Beginning in 1920, the eugenics movement in the US, supported by our intelligentsia, political powerhouses like Teddy Roosevelt, and the best and brightest minds from our premier universities, launched the eugenic movement into US law and policy, including UC Berkeley professors like Samuel Jackson Holmes and Herbert Evans, who started the Human Betterment Society to postulate for eugenics philosophy. It was Dr. Henry Laughlin from Princeton who ran the Cold Harbor Springs Laboratory from 1910 to 1925 that would write model legislation for um, the involuntary institutionalization and sterilization of people with disabilities to prevent, specifically, to prevent procreation by what he saw as those who were unworthy and wrote that we had to present, prevent the passing of the quote unquote germplasm of disability to the rest of society. The legislation was adopted in over 30 states, and it was adopted federally throughout Nazi Germany. This began the dark days when the government was able, using medicine and academy, to take control in an organized and national fashion of the lives of people with disabilities. For the next 40 years, untold numbers were involuntarily sterilized and institutionalized for being disabled, for being poor, for being culturally or racially suspect or inconvenient, and because it was politically expedient, always because it was politically expedient. In California alone, over 60,000 people were forcibly sterilized, many as young as 10 years old. In the South, it was disproportionately black people. In places with reservations, it was disproportionately Indian people. And it was always, always heavily borne by the poor. Eugenics ideology did fall from favor in the 1950s as the public recognized that the Nazi Holocaust was its ultimate expression. After the war, a civil rights movement began to slowly build. Inter Berkeley. In the early 1960s, 
a small goateed, unassuming foreigner who had come to America as a small child, blind in one eye, came to Berkeley as a student. His name was Jacobus Tenbroke, and he would go on to teach here and write a paper called The Right to Live in the World, based on the arguments um, that undergirded the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It was the idea that people with disabilities, too, had a right to participate and live within society. It would be the blueprint for what we knew 30 years later as the Americans with Disabilities Act. Later that decade, a student named Ed Roberts, who was post-polio syndrome and who used an iron lung, was admitted but denied the right to live on campus in regular student housing. He sued the school and the state sided with him. He and the campus then went on to find some ways to enable him to live in a typical dorm, like a typical student. This opened the door to other severely disabled people to come to Cal. They called themselves the Rolling Quads and they began a campaign to help themselves and other disabled people live in the world. They created services on our campus like the Disabled Students Program, which still goes today, and they jackhammered out curbs to make curb cuts for their wheelchairs uh, in a public works program, quote unquote, um, that still goes on today all over. The passion that they had for the human rights of disabled people <laughs> spilled over into the city itself. They formed the first ever Center for Independent Living. They engaged in the longest ever occupation of a federal building. It was to demand funding for living independently in the community for students and non-students alike, and they won. And they got those services funded across the country. Berkeley became a beacon. Disabled people, brilliant disabled people, came here from everywhere in the world and people here went everywhere else in the world. We had people talking about sexuality and family and relationships in the disability community mere years after people had been sterilized and, and institutionalized specifically to prevent them from ever becoming anyone's ancestor, from ever having any descendants. Um, they were going to Scandinavia to talk to people like Wolf Wolfensen about how to build it into the government policies of Scandinavian nations. This was way ahead of, of what anyone really recognized um, would be deeply important later under the UN Convention. A few Berkeley disabled public intellectuals I want to talk to you about. I mentioned Ed Roberts. He became the first disabled policy and administrative leader, leader in a state, California. Um, Judith Human, who wrote large portions of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. She worked for three presidential administrations on education and labor policy thereafter. And Dr. Victor Pineda, who's still teaching here on campus and was instrumental in writing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which took the ADA, enriched it, and launched it for a worldwide audience. 177 nations have now ratified um, that piece of legislation. We now have over 3,000 students with disabilities here. I just wanna like take a moment for that. Like That's amazing, right? Think about that, okay? 3,000 students, how? Why this explosion in the last 10 years? As so many people tell me, the number has exploded in the last 10 years. Well, Ms. Human's Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, was the, the thing that allowed students K to 12 to survive high school. It ensured that people got accommodations. In the 90s and early 2000s, it was expanded so that there were more services offered to more children and early intervention specifically was bulked up. This improved outcomes dramatically in K-12. to They went from just surviving to thriving. That Americans with Disabilities Act that Tenbroke helped set the stage for 40 years before, it was amended in 2010 to expand the types of disabilities that are covered under the act. And in doing so, it made college a viable option for those students thriving K-12, to most of whom had thought they couldn't go on to college after high school because the IDEA, it didn't cover them once they left 12th grade. Almost 7,000 alt media projects, 5,000 cart hours, and untold numbers of small accommodations of other types have been embedded in over 14,000 letters of accommodation and issued by the Disabled Students Program and executed over the last year alone. The school is doing really well. This is a culmination of a movement. So why is there such negativity about this level of disability in our community? as if this were an emergency or some type of invasion, that people call students or colleagues frauds when they request accommodations, that, that there are emails flying around alleging DSP simply rubber stamps accommodation requests and hands them out to all comers. It must be recognized that this is a phenomenon within American society generally. We are told everyone is included, right? That's our narrative, it's you know, a meritocracy. 
So when a new group struggles and breaks its way into an established system, think about black people during Reconstruction entering the voting franchise or women entering politics in the last half of the last century, right? Lock her up. Um, They get villainized. LGBTQ folks entering the institution of America, of um, marriage, they're ruining it for everyone, right? They're ruining marriage. They're pathologized as unworthy, as fraudulent, and as causing an undermining of the validity of the system. This is exacerbated when people with disabilities enter a system because not only are they entering, in this case, the academic world and higher education as disabled and triggering this response, but they bring their other identities too. And disabled people are more often of color, more often immigrant, more often LGBTQ, and more often indigenous. In fact, indigenous people are the most disabled, most frequently disabled in this and all other colonized nations. So we have to realize that the unconscious bias we all carry and the (laughs) dynamics we are driven to by our own national narrative and Americanness exist in this context. We have to recognize that and then we have to push back against it. We have to engage ourselves in deeply knowing how to include disabled people in our work and in our lives. You have to read movement history, come and ask any of us question, attend events like this on campus and bring other people to them that might not think to go. Like there's a disability art show this week that's that DSP might be able to give us the times and dates for. It's a great opportunity, come and see who this community is in action. Um, I've also provided a link to Amy that she'll be able to send out to attendees that has disability culture and resource entities both on and off campus. Use them, enjoy them, go and check out what is offered from the disability community in our area. Remember that Berkeley professors, staff and students together helped to launch eugenics, unfortunately, then helped to produce a movement to overcome eugenics and to launch independent living and shaped renowned disabled public intellectuals who have fundamentally altered the world, not only for disabled people, but for societies in whole. We must continue to do this work. We have an obligation. We have an obligation to perform intellectual reparations and we have an obligation to continue to be a model all over the world right now, in 177 nations, they've signed on to a convention that says they have to figure out under Article 24 how to manifest the right to inclusive education. And they come here from Spain, from Mongolia, from the Eastern European state of Georgia to watch what you do and what we do and how this is actually performed. It was government and academia together that launched the very darkest of years for people with disabilities. It's government and academia together that must continue to partner with disabled people and shed light on the right of this community to live in the world. You're part of that process. And being here today was important. Thank you for that. My hope is that everyone can come to a place of enthusiasm to support inclusion if they understand that when they engage this struggle, they are performing intellectual reparation and acts of guerrilla allyship as part of a hundred year movement. Thank you. I was telling Ella, I, would, I was so happy to be following you. Um, Uh, Thanks so much to Amy Scharf and all of our sponsors for making this possible. Thank you so much for coming on a Monday. (laughs) Um, I apologize for my coughing. I'm dealing with a cold today. Uh, But because my most important experiences of possibility are hearing ideas that might seem unimaginable in an institutional space, I want to talk more conceptually and maybe less practically about the prize I keep my eye on rather than the everyday practicalities of managing disability on campus, uh, because in some ways that still feels so far from the dream I have for this university and for teaching at this university. So uh, don't be surprised, please, if the things I say are not immediately applicable, you know. Um, But at the same time, I think the mindset I try to cultivate against all odds is what I try to keep as I manage my day-to-day life here, and somehow it makes the bureaucratic part easier. Um, So for me, the question for my students is one that doesn't explicitly sound like disability at all, but it could, of course, and it's what do you need to be able to do your best? And underneath this is a sense that even in my exhaustion, I'm so honored to be working with my students. 
what they need to put in place in order to simply be here today, to simply get here, particularly in the economic and political environment of today, right? One where 12% of our students at some point in their career here are unhoused is tremendous. I feel this is particularly true of our students living at the intersections of identities that are disprivileged or even under attack in this space and beyond the university of immigration and being undocumented or unhomed or being indigenous or black and brown or disabled, which can include living with chronic illness like I do. I'm talking about structural disadvantages that make it so that students don't enter this place on equal ground if they enter at all. These are not stereotypes, but realities that many of our existing students are living by, that they find a way through so many barriers to get here, respect, we're in a university environment that, like most universities, sets rather ableist terms for its norms. If it didn't, for instance, it would be entirely imaginable by every member of this university to have disabled people seen as an integral part of this university. To use an example of the exclusion of disabled, chronically ill people from norms, we just lear learned recently by a university-wide announcement that the air quality index condition for a campus-wide action on whether to cancel classes is 200. AQI has to hit 200 when the understanding is that it becomes unhealthy for everyone in the short term. When we know, in fact, that the kinds of wildfire smoke exposure, particularly PM uh, 2.5, is damaging to all lungs. So I'm not interested in bashing on the university here. I'm simply pointing out that that was the normative setting they chose for guidance in a kind of impossibly changing climate. These are the norms that are set. And that means that because of how we are built infrastructurally in our built environments and our mental frameworks of what education means, it's on disabled people to have to ask and answer the question of how could they dare to fit into a place that sets its terms invisibly along ableist lines. Now, I don't know anyone, staff, faculty, or students, who isn't feeling like they have their nose to that total grindstone or that their nose has been already removed by the grindstone. <laughs> the business of our constantly expanding range of work right, takes us away from the structural factors that our students live with and in spite of which many of them actually make their way to us at Berkeley. And I'll share that personally, I always feel like I'm failing still to treat my students with a sense of full justice and that I'm always striving to do better. There are many things in the current life of the university that I think um, feel hard for anyone who's participating here, whether employees or other staff, faculty, and students. So while I know that working with student disabilities can feel for instructors in this current work environment hard to do, um, I strive to remember what my friend, uh, the poet, activist, and theorist Eli Clare said to me once when I was anguishing about my own faculty accommodations and why they seemed so hard for this campus to put into place. Eli said, no, it's not hard to understand. What if we dropped the idea, even for a moment, that disability is hard to understand? There's something there that also presumes that faculty are non-disabled, and that too is kind of messed up, right? If we take ourselves out of that mindset of the system, that we are in some very real sense as instructors, agents of an institution of higher ed, and somehow shift to at least not doing further harm to the bodies and minds or body minds while they're here on campus. Where does that put us in terms of how we organize our lives here, including our teaching lives? One thing that became stunningly clear to me as a young professor, a sick, young sick professor on this campus, okay, I wasn't that young, um, was that there, there, there is a drama that lives beneath the declaration that higher education is about cult cultivating the life of the mind. And furthermore, that a university is something in, of an engine of capacity. Whether we're talking about labor or about the intellectual training, a kind of additional capacitation that students undergo that can, of course, be very valuable. There's a reason they're all here. That drama of capacity that lives under the life of the mind is the usage of bodies as invisible mercenaries to the minds that are at stake in the university. These bodies have to move, they have to breathe. These bodies have to feel that the day is possible, that life itself needn't be fought for before to they, they get to the business of elaborating them. 
So if we realize the massive setup that the idea of the life of the mind constitutes, that actually a lot of conditions need to be in place for the life of the mind to operate. And furthermore, we really need to define the life of the mind in terms that are not simply about a certain narrow field of intellectual achievement. I think we can begin to approach disability as something that is in fact not hard to understand. There are ways of being that are defined as what the fantasy of the life of mind rejects. And that makes me feel the depth of the work it takes for students to be here. Knowing that it may be harder for any student, and perhaps especially hard for students of color than white students who are living at the intersections of class and labor, race, sexuality, gender, and disability and illness, to be even willing to recognize and approach the DSP office with any hope of finding a solution for them. Um, my feeling so often that I get from students, from the disproportionate numbers of white students as versus the students of color who approach me about DSP accommodations, when statistically, as Ella shared, those numbers actually should be inverted. That's a message about the every, everyday denial of intersectionality. And my feeling on this campus is still, there's a, there's a sense, okay, what's your thing? Oh, disability, oh, what's your thing? Oh, you're trans, oh, what's your thing? You're an immigrant. Somehow, the possibility of living at multiple intersections doesn't seem imaginable. Um, and, and I think that sets us up in some ways to not recognize disability, to, to, rec to, to, to not see the fact that disability attaches uh, more often than not to positions of disprivilege. And this is not me being sentimental so much as recognizing the histories, including settler colonialism and other colonialisms, racisms, environmental justice, injustice, which can itself be disabling, and labor histories that have brought us here to this particular configuration of being together. So I feel like we have ambiently almost a single issue, not an intersectional culture of services. And um, that goes against the knowledge that intersectionality theorist Kimberly Crenshaw light, laid down about the importance of recognizing <coughs> in the law the intersectionalities lived by black women. So intersectionality as a framework recognizes that many systems of privilege and disprivilege um, um, accompany each of us in our respective positions in our multiple communities. So as an instructor, I'm thinking about a kind of sensitivity and alertness to the possibility that ma many people in our community here at Berkeley are living at those intersections. And as a professor, this means even in gender and women's studies where it's almost like our wheelhouse and we kind of get to say, you know, we, 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 we're supposed to, you know, walk the walk there or act the act, right? It, it means I'm trying to turn up my sensitivity, read between the lines, knowing that the invisible hierarchies on this campus are fully in operation when a student inter it approaches you at all. And any claim for them may be difficult to share with you. Um, and I venture to say that the assumption for students is all too often that you as a professor are a default agent, right, of intellectual and other, other forms of ableism. That's one of the legacies that we're still living in, in really embodied ways here at the university. What would it mean to design a class where those who couldn't handle the AQI reading of 150 didn't need to literally drop out of that day's class? This has, I think, a lot to do with how we frame our classes around multiple forms of access that are co-present and maybe already there, already set up there, rather than forcing DSP accommodations into feeling like exceptional claims of difference. Um, I, I don't want to leave it up to my students to have to take the risks of disclosure and markedness for all of the wonder of having DSP um, to, you, to assist you in the first place. And so I hope in our discussion that we can share some of the ways that this is easier than it might seem. So as instructors, um, as well as any community on, member on campus, when we're thinking about only a bureaucratic or legal approach to disability, um, what Ella called compliance, sitting back and only relying on the work that our wonderful DSP office is, is doing on a shoestring for our students, um, uh, thinking about things like we might just have time to administer that DSP letter or I, I feel like I have to observe this legal requirement. We're not honoring this deeper sense of, I think, why we're here when we have the time to really sit down and think about it. Um, my deepest hope is that this university can see itself as engaged with social justice at every level, right? Um, rather than, say, having a mission of helping communities outside of the university with our superior knowledge or delivering services that look like, look like equity. 
Um, and that framework of help and superiority, I think, can in itself be further disabling to communities within. Um, and we almost risk being in cons conspiracy with, with the kinds of strains of thought that led to the eugenics movement in the first place. Um, okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> Sorry, again, I want to, I'm so appreciative that there are so many people um, at this event. I f often feel like on campus that there are two halves of campus. One half that is very intent on trying to make, uh, talk about disability inclusion, and another half that feels that it's really not their job. And um, I'm hoping that um, this is an indication of the growing numbers of people who really do feel um, that it is part of of the job to make this a, a campus where everyone can thrive. So w one of my um, friends at Ohio State University, uh, Professor Margaret Price, often begins her public talks um, after doing the land acknowledgment, by also doing an acknowledgment about the space and thinking about how the space allows some people to be included and other people to be excluded. And Mel did a bit of this uh, work already. Like we can think about, for example, the, the air that we're breathing in this room, that it's at the right temperature for many of us, but for some of us, it's too hot, some of it's, it's too cold. For some of us, the level of particulates and VOCs that are in the air are too toxic, and we're having a hard time with, with that. Um, um, the g carpet is outgassing. Um, um, yeah, we still have a lot of material in, in, in everything from the wildfires. The light levels, for some of us, the light levels are just perfect. It's, it's Goldilocks. For others, the lights are too bright. For some of us, we can see the flicker, and it's starting to give us um, a migraine and uh, interrupt our, our process. For others, uh, it's too dim, and they wish that it was brighter. The seats that you're sitting in, for some of them, you, they're the right height, they fit well, they're relatively comfortable. For others, they aren't. They don't fit your body, they don't fit your size, they don't fit your weight, um, they don't fit your mode of transportation, they aren't comfortable. Um, uh, th th for others, the audio levels, for some it works. We, we have a loop system, but for other people, they don't have um, the device that would interface with the, with the hearing aid loop or the mics don't work. Um, we don't have a sign language interpreter which, or a captioner. Um, we didn't have a request, but oftentimes the framing of those requests are such that people can't just drop in. For the people who can hear me audibly, you are free to think at 11.58, oh, that's right, there's an academic inclusion seminar, I should go to that and, and decide on the spur of the moment to drop in. Um, uh, deaf and hard of hearing people have to decide at least four days in advance, um, ideally in the words of the inclusion statements, to put in those requests. Um, and this is not to blame the staff. The staff tries incredibly hard, but we are in an environment that's, that is not designed to easily facilitate people who, who are deaf or hard of hearing to, to drop in. Um, we have uh, visual materials which are not all accessible. So. We live in an environment in which the fit between how our minds and bodies are works really well for some people and doesn't for others. Um, disability studies scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson calls disabled folks misfits, and I really like that, that term because we're both uh, often troublemakers, <laughs> but we're also, the experience of living disabled is to be a misfit, to live in a world that is not designed for us, or to put it another way, a world that is designed to other us, to make us feel as though we are not uh, uh, part of it. We shouldn't be part of it. And so we have to try harder to articulate that, that we have a right to a sense of belonging at this institution. So how can we create an environment where people feel less misfit and more included, that they feel that campus is somewhere that is really designed for, th for them to exist and thrive. And this is, this is an um, event where we're talking about teaching. But as a disabled faculty member, it's, and talking with other uh, disabled faculty and staff, it's clear that many of the attitudes that some, uh, some people bring into the classrooms are also the same attitudes that they bring into faculty meetings, the same attitudes that they bring into staff meetings, and especially in, when it comes to hiring, retention, promotion, that these are the same attitudes that get discussed. 
So while it's nice to compartmentalize and think, oh, well, disability and inclusion is something that really just is something that belongs in the classroom, it really isn't. It's really um, something that we need to be thinking about all of the time. Um, the SCDR um, uh, had uh, gave campus a, a FOIA request a couple of years ago asking how many disabled faculty there were on campus. And we got a number which roughly equates to about 1.5% of faculty. And we feel this is both underreporting and overreporting. One, we feel like it's, it, so the 1.5% is the number of people who have checked the little box, and you might have gotten a thing about a couple weeks ago asking you if you want to check the box or not, is the number of people who check the box. At one level, it's severely underreporting because we think that it can't be 1.5%. If you include all the people who, who um, have disabilities that we know of, that um, um, it has to exceed 1.5. So clearly, people are very afraid to check the box. Right? There's something that's going on. Either they don't feel, well, maybe the fact that you know, I have asthma or emphysema, that doesn't, I'm not really disabled, and so I shouldn't check the box. That's for, only for people who are really disabled. Or perhaps they feel like there might be secondary stigma or primary stigma associated. If I check the box, maybe my chair will see this. Maybe my HR analyst will see this, and maybe bad things, un unknown bad things will happen. So at one level, there's severe underreporting within the faculty in checking the box. At the other level, we also feel like, wow, that's a, that, in some levels, that's a lot of faculty because when we count the number of, of out disabled faculty, we don't get to two, we may, might get to two hands, right? The number of faculty who are really out about their disability, who, who have taken public stances to, to incorporate that, that doesn't, we, 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 may, we may get to two hands, but we don't exceed two hands, we don't get to toes. And so what does that mean, though? What does it mean that so many people are in the closet, that disability is something that is talked about in, in hushed tones, that, oh, we might acknowledge that someone is, has a disability, but why is it that they don't identify as disabled? Why are there so few disabled faculty who are present? Right? We increasingly talk about having a faculty body that more closely looks like the student body. And shouldn't that be at all, uh, at all levels? Right? So, as Ella had mentioned, thanks to the movement, we have increasingly seen the number of disabled undergraduate students increase. We've also seen the number of disabled graduate students increase, but we haven't seen the number of disabled faculty increase. And we really need to examine some of our own attitudes as to why that is. Why is it when we have particular faculty meetings or hiring committees that disabled candidates don't get through? And how do those reflect some of the conversations that we are having when we talk about teaching disabled students? Like a lot of conversations circle around what meritocracy is, or how do we fairly evaluate disabled students, right? Um, and here I want to point out that the experience of many disabled students is that they really suffer in many intro classes. But by the time they get to be a junior or senior and find their major and find their niche, they start to thrive. And I think part of that is, is that the point of intro <coughs> classes is often to otherize people, to really winnow them out. It's not about doing anything except um, to uh, determine which one of, of, of the students in the first and second years are really worthy of our attention. By the time you, you, make, you pass through that gauntlet to, to the more advanced classes, you are one of ours, and it's our job as faculty to allow you as a student to thrive. And our focus shifts. And I wonder, to what degree can we think about this across the campus? How can we think? What would it mean to have a curriculum where we really think that all of the students in our first and second years are ours, and that they are ours to thrive, to thrive intellectually? Right? Not all of them will necessarily be majors. You can still have that component of, well, you know, I, we, we, we tried to do all we could to make you thrive as much as you could, but, you know, maybe you aren't meant to be a biologist. But it's not on the basis of any of the false criteria that we create in the winnowing processes that we, that we have traditionally uh, used. And I think that would really start to change how, how, we, how we teach. Um, um, Marsha talked about her class um, having about uh, 20 students in 50 who are disabled, and you know I teach a disability class 
um, as well, and, and there are about 20 of the 40 students uh, are disabled. And it changes your teaching. It, it really does. It really makes you think. I, I, I've, it is hard. You have to th fundamentally shift what would it mean for all my students to create an environment where all my students can thrive. Not all of them are going to get A's, but I am trying to create the environment where all of them can thrive intellectually and get the most out of you know, the, the four hours a week that, that we share together, the 13 um, weeks in the semester that we share together. And, and, and that, has, that is, that is a, a, a fundamental uh, uh, shift um, for all of us. Now, many times, the comments I hear, well, one of my concerns, and it reflects some of the comments you, you hear on um, pla places like TeachNet, is, you know, disabled students are coddled, they'll never make it in the real world. That also reflects on statistics where in the 30 years since the passing of the ADA, the employment rate has dropped for disabled people. And many people have, despite, you know, supposedly knowing better, correlation is not causation, right? Um, we have this sort of concern that if we don't toughen up the students, that they will not get jobs. Um, this neglects all of what my um, um, prior uh, colleagues at, um, have said, that disability is deeply intersectional. It is very true that disabled people are not getting jobs, but disabled people are also often lying at the intersections of, of poverty, of immigration status, of race, of gender, of medical neglect, and other factors. And we need to understand that there are multiple other factors th that are being closed. And rather than accepting that, oh, I guess some people just aren't going to get jobs, and, and allowing them to, to, to be part of, of a larger educational neglect, we need to really ask ourselves, how can we best prepare our students for an environment in which they can thrive? Maybe they won't uh, thrive in, in, in all of the occupations, but we have figured out a way for them to, to, th to thrive in the world, to find their voice, to be able to self-advocate, to find the employment opportunities where they can best be suited, or for them to feel empowered to create the employment opportunities for themselves and others where they can, they can best um, um, be suited. That is the sort of change in our thinking that, that I hope that all of us, by virtue of being in this classroom, um, want to be part of. So thank you. OK, we're going to switch gears here. And um, we're at just a little past one, so I'm sure uh, some people just want to get up and stretch and find food and find the bathrooms. Um, what we are thinking uh, formally to do uh, for about 10 minutes is to uh, have you find people who are nearby or across the room uh, if you want to seek out someone you don't know. Uh, and uh, get into small groups and to uh, talk. You might want to return to what you wrote about on the cards. You might want to, I would think, talk about what you are thinking as you have heard the three speakers already, what ideas have come up, what questions have come up, and just kind of share what most interests you at this point, at 1.05 p.m. today, about uh, the questions that we're talking about. So if you can um, find yourself a little group, and please feel free also to um, do what you need to take a break and, and just uh, talk about what you're thinking. That's what we'd like. Oh, oh. Can we get back together? We need a gavel. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try one more time to regather us. Um, so we, we, we spent this little period reading people's written questions and realizing there were so many and trying to figure out what to do about those. And then, of course, there's been much more generated by your talking. But what we are going to do now is just open up uh, for a period of questions, about 15 minutes. And, um, and then we'll have another round later. Um, and we'll try to answer questions other ways, too, the, the questions that don't get sufficiently answered by this, in this time period. But uh, I'm just going to open up for questions. And, and there is a, 
Um, Mike, so please um, uh, wait for the mic before asking a question. Give a very short summary of the questions as as we've read them. Okay, we can. Yeah, and then we'll just cut off at the other end. I mean, oh, okay. I, I, it's going to take a second. Um, th they all generally fall into somewhat these categories: is uh, how to get faculty actually take the accommodation seriously. Um, what is this business of privacy and um, confidentiality, and how to manage that in all different ways? Um, real hands-on questions how do we do this how do we do this in a large classroom um, um, and are faculty required to change the way we teach <laughs> pretty much <laughs> okay <laughs> okay sorry back to you folks uh, is this can you is that oh um, I just an issue came up during the panel of privilege and I thought it was really interesting, and I was wondering if you all could say a little bit more about that, because I feel like um, there, there's almost this varsity blue level of, of controversy around, you know, privileged parents will do anything for their kids, including getting them diagnoses in order to get them more uh, advantages versus folks who need accommodation. So, I, and I think Mel, I think it, you mentioned that the f people who actually request accommodations don't seem to reflect the demographics of who we know need them. So I, I'd just love to hear more about how you all hold those two things. Oh, sorry, caught you with your mouth full. <laughs> What's that? I'll take it. We have to do a reality check with assumptions about people with disabilities. Um, there's pervasive history here of malingerers and cheaters and people trying to take advantage. And the reality is that the severe oppression of people with disabilities makes the vast, vast, vast majority of people who struggle with some impairment to, to shoot low in their lives. Mm -hmm. The opposite of trying to get a job that you're not qualified for. The opposite, you know, of the visually impaired person wanting to drive a bus or be a neurosurgeon. It's just not the reality. And yet this history haunts us of the assumptions that pervade and influence public policy around social benefits for people with disabilities is that they're teeters. So I want us to just keep that in mind when we begin to suspect or have concerns about that, that, that we have all been impacted by that. And w the students that I know who've re who have taken advantage of these, who have enjoyed these accommodations, are 99.9% .9 extremely sincere in their need and their application of these accommodations. I, I think one of the ways to think about it isn't the uh, students who are, have asked for the accommodations, but who are the students who haven't asked for the accommodations? I think uh, many times if you're a minoritized student or you're an undocumented student or you're a student who's first generation, it's very hard to, to one, to know that you actually have this right and then to be able to articulate it. And articulate it both ways, sort of have the sense that you are allowed to articulate it, but also have the resources that you may need a doctor's note or a psychiatrist's note or some other, f feel like you, you don't have the appropriate paperwork to do that. And, and despite all of DSP's efforts to be as open and accepting, there are many students who feel that doing that would be somehow letting down their family, letting down um, um, you know, the group that they belong to. And that is the most difficult thing. And I, you know, I think one of the things we need to do as faculty is to figure out how to encourage students to say, look, just get the DSP accommodations early on. You may never have to use it. Just ask for it, just make sure it's in your paperwork. So when there is that moment at the midterms or finals, when you're realizing that you know, things have ratcheted up a bit more than you can self-accommodate, right? That you can, you can do this. Now, we all know that rates of anxiety and, and depression among, are just skyrocketing amongst both our undergrads and, and grad students. And I think much of this is because we, are so, we, are so f we feel that we have to self-accommodate so much. And we're just pushing ourselves beyond our limits. Um, we don't feel like we are allowed to ask for the things that are needed for us to thrive. So I think the, to 
and the back is how do we how do we enable all of our students, including those who are underprivileged, to feel like they have the right to ask for these things? Uh, yeah, I would just add um, to those comments. I was just thinking about the way the dismantling of the welfare state has been operating, and it's in part by um, spreading stories about fraud, right? Um, and yet, yeah. I want what is left of the welfare system to continue in part because it's all we have, right? And I think, um, of course, I, I would love to imagine a bureaucracy that works deeply differently with regard to disability, but we don't have that right now. So as much as these, I think you call them varsity blue narratives circulate, I would counter them with an insistence that, well, yes, I mean, every, uh, I mean, it's, it's sure, it's possible. Any, any institutional system can be gamed, but, but in, in sharing those stories, you're ignoring the, the very real possibility that people across all groups of privilege very much need these, and I'm gonna make that assumption until I have a huge amount of evidence otherwise, and I really don't have that evidence. And I just want to make a snide remark that if we recall that the, the whole Vasti Blues, that most of that was sent around sports recruitment, and yet there are no calls of, oh my God, the sports are just rife with so much fraud and corruption. We should just shut down all of the sports and use all that funding for making sure that all of our students have scholarships and et cetera. We don't have that conversation, and we should ask why we don't have that conversation. <laughs> Let's see. I think Darcy next. I just, I just wanted to Hold on, Darcy. Turn green. <laughs> Hi. Um, I thought that was a very pertinent uh, conversation, and I also was most struck by the question of how many students and persons would never define themselves as needing any accommodation, and how the university communicates to the entire entering student bodies their rights to that. Um, I'm in a totally different situation, but I have had my own personal um, circumstance where I would never have thought there was any mechanism that I should have been using bureaucratically. I mean, universities are huge bureaucracies, right? But I am really troubled by the possibility, not that the privileged may not be disabled, but that many of the disenfranchised don't seek out, as you say, for all the reasons you just said, Karen. So I, I, I feel like that's a really fundamental question I hadn't thought of as, as much as I am now, and I thank you all for that. I also want to just say quickly, as the art historian here, that only Karen wrote her pronouns large enough for us to read them <laughs> in the group. So when you're trying to be inclusive, use bigger print. <laughs> Can I say something about, uh, to go back to the, the issue about what, what the university can do to, to help people begin to ask for what we need? And I, for about a decade, I worked as an um, assistant dean of undergraduate advising here, and I worked mainly with students who were flunking out. And one day I had a guy who had a, um, a chronic illness that flared up and then he'd have some months after treatment where he had the energy and focus to do the work and then he would, towards the end of that time, it would become really hard. And it was weirdly helpful to students if they had just blanket failed everything because that was recognizable to the institution rather than an uneven record. And in this case, the student had failed everything and gotten an A in one class. So this was kind of a bureaucratic issue for me I needed some explanation of it at least. So I asked him, why did you get an A in this one class? And he said, it's because the teacher made it so clear on the first day that she wanted us to come and talk to her about what was going on with us and it made it so easy to do. And so she made it possible to get, for me to get an A. And I've thought about that ever since that moment, about uh, for teachers in the room or for staff people interacting with uh, whoever the, the clients are, um, I think that's the key, is how do you begin to open that conversation in advance and be really conscious that you should. 
I, I can just share a hot tip that I use. Um, I have students fill out a form, the first class, with some contact information. And on it, I say, DSP students, please speak to me directly if you feel comfortable. If you don't want to talk, please email me because I care about you and support you to receive your accommodations. And so let's connect. And they do. I think the form has to say, do you know what DSP is? Well, right. I get, I, yeah, but because I teach, well, because I, I, yeah, I have, I'm very privileged here because the presence of my disabled students in my class is a bonus to the content. So we talk about it from the first day. Yes. Yeah. I, oh, hold on. One comment from Georgina. Uh, just to um, add to this discussion. Um, I also teach disability studies so that it's a bonus for me that I have disabled students in the room and that they're, you know, and that I'm disabled and so it's sort of there. But even in the classes that I teach where that's that ostensibly the topic, I have a statement on my syllabus and I invite students, particularly disabled students, to come talk to me about their accommodations. And I, I say, you know, the accommodation letter is kind of a template and it's limited to what, you know, it may not apply to my particular class. So there may be things that they can tell me to do um, that ultimately is going to help them thrive, but is also going to be helpful to other students. Um, so I frame it that way. And I always consider it a, a triumph, actually, and it happens nearly every <laughs> semester, when a student comes to me and says, you, at the end of the semester, you said, and says, you know, I have gone now to the DSP because I didn't know that this or that condition that I have would qualify, or I was afraid to announce it, or I didn't know what accommodations were available. And so I think it is a part of our job, as we would call out other services on campus that are available to students, uh, to sort of indicate that, that you have this information and that you can share it with students, and that the DSP exists um, for them. Sorry, I see you. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, you know, sometimes the, we get DSP letters in the middle of the semester, and, and of, of course it can feel like, oh, oh shit, my system, my system. But it's helpful to remember that people are living their lives and come to realizations on the time of their lives, and those lives are, are not behaving according to the semester schedule. How could they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just, again, trying to reframe uh, to, to, to recognize the, the lives students bring to us. <coughs> okay, let's get to you. Um, thank you all for giving your time for this today. I'm really glad this conversation is happening. I appreciated the framing also about um, uh, beyond uh, access. And um, Mel, you were starting to speak to, to some of these pieces. Um, and, and I really appreciated the framing of trying to keep in mind our actual real dreams and visions beyond even what's pragmatically possible. And so I'm curious for you, but also for everyone, um, dealing with the immense cognitive dissonance and pushing the envelope as, like what are some of your strategies for pushing the envelope as much as possible in the classroom? Because when we think about all of these intersectionalities, right, and the this university space in and of itself is inherently inaccessible, right? The cost of tuition, all the prerequisites to even get in, and then it's like a cog in this larger system that's all about hierarchy. And we love to like even, you know, promote our hierarchical bona fides. Number one public university in the world, blah, 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 blah. And it has all these real, you know, material consequences, right? Um, and so I often feel such the hypocrisy the, as much as I want to like, you know, internalize the learnings I'm so grateful for, especially from disab disability justice frameworks of no body mind left behind and what that means. And yet on the daily then, 
you know, contributing to an immense workload that students have that's completely unreasonable, that our own workload as faculty is also completely unreasonable, right? Grading students and, you know, which in ways that don't take into account that some students are having to also work full time or are responsible for elder care, or child care, all these things. Like it's inherently unfair. There's so much cognitive dissonance. And so I'm just wondering, what strategies you have for trying to, you know, be transparent, have these conversations, unpack these things with students, but then also how do you not just recreate it in those kind of micro practices on the daily? Thank you. I know you addressed Mel, such an important set of questions, um, but I'm thinking in terms of time that since our next section is supposed to be for um, Marcia and Georgina to talk specifically about teaching strategies, that maybe that's a good segue. And then, I don't mean to cut you off, Mel, but we can return. So um, that's OK with can everybody. Can I just say one brief thing? I think many of us are also frustrated by those letters. And it's not the best format. I, you know, For me, it would be just, why do we have to click through and then get a PDF that down downloads to our computer that lives in our download folder forever? Right, that is, you know, all the cautions about educational privacy seem pretty stupid when we get a darn PDF letter. Why can't we just get, you know, when you're teaching a large lecture class, why can't, why don't I know how many students have already requested proctoring? I have no way of knowing, so I have to ask the students again. None of this is to say that we can't do more, or that, you know, DSP can't do more or better, or you know that um, there can't be better systems. But yeah, I. So I, I, I don't want this to be an entirely on, on um, I think that's a good thing right back to you guys. So. OK, I'll turn it over to um, Marcia first, or, or Georgina, you want to go? OK, to Georgina first. <laughs> uh, I, before talking about teaching, I just, um, I don't know, this is in my mind, so I'll talk about it. Um, to talk about uh, memories of being a disabled student years ago, and just just beyond the time when um, IDEA would have would have helped, uh, and uh, going to college at an elite Ivy League university uh, where they didn't have a disabled students program, uh, I got services from the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, and to some people, that sounds like oh, good, the federal government should do this and not the, the university. Uh, not so much. Anyway, um, this this um, the f the funny thing about the story was that I had I happened to have two specialists, two social workers at the DOR, who worked with me, and they were primarily responsible for getting me text in alternative formats, um, which in those days meant recordings, of, you know, analog recordings of people reading to me. Um, and as I was an English major, the uh, budget that they had for me always ran out. So I spent a lot of time arguing with them about how I needed more. And they argued back and, you know, um, basically asked me why I was an English major. Uh, because being the Department of Rehabilitation, their goal was to make me employable. And then, as now, everybody thinks that being an English major means you're unemployable. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I had, two, I had two specialists, which I think was kind of a fluke. I don't think this was really policy, but I did have these two specialists. And they did a kind of good cop, bad cop thing. So there was the nice one who, who felt my pain. You know, so when I was having a bad day, I could go there and say, oh, it's so hard and I can't do that. She, oh, it must be so hard for you, Georgina. It's really terrible. And, you know, and I said, well, can you get me more money? To, and she, well, no, I can't write the check, you know. So she was nice but useless. And the other one was the tough cop. And she used to say to me quite regularly, probably every time I was there, she would say, Georgina, you need to learn to accept your limitations. I mean, she said it so often that I thought of getting a t-shirt printed <laughs> that would say, accept your limitations, comma, Georgina, which she could wear when I came in. <laughs> and it would be ironic because, you know, I'm blind, I wouldn't be able to read it. <laughs> um, but, you know, irony was in short supply <laughs> at the DOR. 
in those days. Um, but I tell this story not to be, you know, sort of the old disabled person saying, oh, the disabled kids today have it so easy. Um, but actually, what I, what I realized, even at the time, was that, you know, what she was asking me to do was not to accept my limitations, but to accept their limitations, <laughs> yeah. right? And their inability to imagine a different way of doing things. <clears throat> And so I take that with me as a teacher. And, you know, like many faculty, um, I had no training in teaching. Um, basically, when I started teaching, I was doing the same thing that other, that went on when I was in school, right? In terms of lecturing and giving quizzes and, you know, doing all this sort of stuff. But over the years, I started to, you know, as I, as I was uh, contemplating the, the population of disabled students in my classrooms, I started to think about not um, what was wrong with the students and what the accommodations were supposed to fix, but what was wrong with my teaching practices. Um, and so that, that had an impact in terms of is a three-hour in-class exam necessarily the best way for students to demonstrate their mastery of a topic? Um, it also has an impact on things such as my understanding of, of student presence. If, uh, if, an accom if a student's accommodation includes, um, you know, uh, 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 absences from class, how does that, you know, how can that student still register their presence in the class? What form would that take? What, what, um, what technology, for instance, could I use um, that would allow students to be present even if they weren't present? Or be present retrospectively? Um, things like attention, things like participation, if a student has, uh, is unable for, for various reasons to speak in front of a group, is there a different way for that student to participate in a class discussion? So in some sense, when I think of, of the accommodations letters that I get in the aggregate, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, so there, there are issues around testing, there's issues around um, deadlines, issues around participation, in, uh, issues around attendance. And so thinking about how I can shift, uh, shift the, the, the rules and procedures of my classroom uh, to fit those people. And the other thing that I often try to do, because sometimes people come to me and they say, you know, in a panic, and they say, I have a blind student in my class this semester, what am I gonna do? And you know, I say, well, talk to the DSP, and then I talk about various things. But then what I worry about is that then, then those, those accommodations that they put into place, do they, do they take them away mm -hmm. when there's not a blind student in the, in the room? Mm -hmm. Whereas, for instance, the, the um, uh, re requirement to produce uh, accessible um, uh, documents, uh, if you're posting online, I have to think about accessibility of, of print material. Those documents are, are easier for everybody to use. They're better for everybody to use. Other students benefit from having um, uh, accessible PDFs. Um, so why would, you, why would you take them away just because that individual student is no longer in your room? Those are just a couple of Great. thoughts. I will share a, a, a brief personal story that helped illuminate the struggles we're all experiencing. Um, I, I was a little kid with metal leg braces in my uh, elementary school years, and my mom was a teacher. And my mom had to fight for me to be included in the Albany School District, just up the road, um, because they were thinking I should be bust somewhere else, because what? And it was the era of polio. So I had a lot of that drama go on with being stared at, teased, lots of hospitalization. And my mom was this tough fighter for me. She was an amazing mom of the 50s. And 
she was successful in getting me fully mainstreamed and having some minor accommodations. I was a typical kid other than my somewhat uh, medical circumstances with spina bifida. So decades later, leap forward into my uh, growing awareness about the disability rights community as a person with a disability. And my mom is a t teaching in Albany and she comes to me one day and says, these disabled children in my class are so much work. And I'm listening and fascinated and, oh my God, I say, mom, you fought so hard for your own kid and now you're <laughs> resisting. And you know, and she told me more, and she, you know, clearly did not have enough help in her elementary school classroom to handle children with different kinds of disabilities who are newly mainstreamed into the Albany school district, some with behavioral problems. And yeah, it's hard. This is hard. And we're still learning how to do it well. So I am still learning. For the first time, I have two, not one, students who are nonverbal autistic students in my class who have, who use their iPads to communicate. They have an assistant with them. Sometimes it's their moms. They're two of them. They're friends with each other. And I'm learning how to include them as much as possible in the discussion of the class. And we, I use a lot of interactive. And so I'm learning. I'm checking in with them regularly. And it's not that easy to make sure that they are included fully in the way that meets my standards. Um, so it, it's legitimately a learning experience for us. Um, the laws are vague in some way, places, in some places um, quite clear. So um, what I'd like to do is just briefly um, respond to some of the questions that you've submitted. Um, one <laughs> really good hard question is what does reasonable mean? Reasonable accommodation. Well, to the letter of the law and the Americans with Disabilities Act and other laws, it's very vague. It's, develop, it's determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So what we have to do is think, and with as much caring and compassion as well as rigor as we can muster, and get help thinking. So it's not something we do in our own heads. We talk to other people, talk with a student, talk with the ESP, get input as much as possible. I know, meanwhile, balancing all the work that we're doing with every, everything else in our lives. But the concept of reasonable was the best we could do in the drafters of these laws to think how to think about this individual person. And it's very much an individualized approach to thinking about this human being in this context, which is a good thing. Um, are we required to, quote unquote, fundamentally alter the nature of the service? No. We are not required to change the way we fundamentally, there's another big word, fundamentally change, the, change what we do. We are required to be thoughtful and flexible as much as is reasonable. So there again, I really strongly encourage you to, to get assistance from DSP and from other minds thinking about what is fundamentally and what is reasonable. Um, there are many questions about privacy um, related issues. Um, how do you handle what may seem inevitably as singling out a student with a disability for the special treatment they may appear to be getting? And there is privacy. Um, confidentiality as much as possible. The students are very much entitled to complete anonymity. And that's one of the questions that you need to, or I'm encouraging, we are encouraging you to talk with a student about. The student is not required to reveal their diagnosis at all because that may be so stigmatized that it puts the student in danger particularly with severely stigmatizing labels like psychiatric labels and other kinds of conditions that scare people because of disability oppression. So the student is completely in charge of what he or she reveals to others. And the accommodations themselves, what we offer to assist them in what is referred to as a leveling the playing field, which is always an amusing metaphor because what playing fields aren't level. Um, so that's a tricky thing. 
and we take the guidance from the student about what they want to share. And it gets really awkward because if that student is moving to a, a low distraction environment for their test, it's kind of red flag or neon sign, I'm special. So we just do it as thoughtfully and gracefully as we can muster. Um, Okay, many questions that just about the logistics, how to find low distraction environments and so on. Get help from DSP and from the, they will help you find the appropriate accommodations for your students and they have been terrifically supportive of my students and my needs. Um, there are a number of questions about language and terminology which we're not gonna be able to get into today because it's so interesting and complicated. But there's great stuff on the web that you need to check into. There are guidelines about this and that term. So check it out because the information is available about the language and terminology that we're struggling to use at this moment and it will change. So be willing to make a mistake and apologize, which is fine, go ahead. Um, and some people asked about, again, related to confidentiality, um, there's no reason to keep the reality of there being disabled students in your class a big secret. It's part of your students, all of your students' education to learn about the ADA and disability accommodations. So you are welcome to, to mention early on that there are some disabled students in the, in the class who are receiving accommodations under the law. And if they have questions about that, they can talk to you, they can go to the web, they can learn about it. It's all part of their education that we want to encourage you to share with them and them with each other. Um, okay, I think those are, I mean, there's a million more questions, but, um, and there are lots of questions about how do we do it? How do we accommodate the student? And that's where DSP has been incredibly helpful. Please use their services because they will help you figure out the logistics of testing and assignments and, and fundamentally are not altering your teaching. Okay, let's go back to the group. Okay, so we have a little time for questions still. Um, about 10 minutes left. So back in the back. <coughs> Way back. It's Carolyn, right? Yeah. Carolyn Swalina from DSP. Hi there, this is Carolyn Swalina from DSP. Thank you, Sue. Is this picking up across the room? I can't hear, I'm hard of hearing, so I can't tell what it's doing out there. Um, but Pretty just well. wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that when we are talking about accommodations, what we're really talking about is the removal of barriers. So our program really focuses on working with students to identify, based on their lived experiences, people with disabilities and the impacts of those disabilities and the way that Berkeley is constructed, which isn't wholly accessible, what barriers might they be and what accommodations might remove those. So going back to some of the earlier question around students who might be um, unfairly or inaccurately utilizing accommodations, our focus is really tailored to the individual student looking at access and an effective accommodation and removing a barrier would be a positive experience for a student. If a student didn't have a barrier, they wouldn't necessarily benefit um, from a particular accommodation. Um, I usually share, you can give me triple time on an Italian exam and I'll fail it because I don't know Italian. Um, so all the time in the world won't, won't generate um, you know information I haven't work for. I'll also share and, and just give a plug that I do hold drop-in hours here in AIS um, this semester on Tuesdays from 2 to 4 specifically for faculty and staff who want to talk about accommodations and implementing accommodations and making your courses accessible. So I'd, I'd encourage you to come and visit or, or email me at cbs at berkeley.edu and I'd be happy to talk with you. And that's Carolyn Swalina, S-W-A-L-I-N-A. Thanks, Thursday. <laughs> Great conversation. I, we just got an email about uh, new efforts for instructional resiliency on campus. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually wondering what the panel thinks are both the opportunities and um, your concerns 
given the ways in which our lives are being fed by multiple disruptions, what would you like to see uh, from a disab disability justice framework housed inside how the university is thinking about responding? Um, I'm not sure if this quite applies, but I've been trying to do an experiment to see how much of my classes I can allow <coughs> telecommuting. Um, so seminars are easy for just adding one more person via Zoom, but I'm also experimenting with my lectures as well. And I think it's very interesting that, you know, when it comes to strike actions or when it comes to um, environmental hazards, um, campus will say, you know, develop this resilience. But when it comes to like thinking about disabled students on a regular basis, we, we're not encouraged to think how can we really change the structure of our classrooms to incorporate more students, mm -hmm. students who can't come to campus or, you know, um, um, or, you know, when paratransit breaks down, all these other things. We don't think about that. We, uh, we externalize that. But when we, when it, become something that we can't quite externalize because it's a campus-wide thing. Suddenly we're asked to develop this resilience, but I think the more we can start to do that as a regular practice, how can we think of, we are increasingly going to be in a climate where we cannot always um, physically attend. Um, and we need to think of a better way to make sure that all, all the students who can't physically or uh, psychically attend can still be part of our of our community. So in that sense, yes. So part of me really wants to build on that. Then the, then the whole um, snarky side of me will also talk about the other <laughs> flip side of resilience. But I'll leave that for another, another thing. There's this performance artist, um, Sandra Ibarra, who once um, made this performance about resilience. And it involved her just running on a treadmill and just getting <laughs> you know, just <laughs> beyond, just beyond exhausted. And um, it was interesting to me that the resilience effort is about this particular semester, right? That's a way of compensating labor hours and student, student, um, student counting, uh, the kind of quantitative approach as opposed to this broader qualitative approach. Um, one of the things I did when we had a cancellation of class was to think about asynchronous engagement and having discussions that we would have or ordinarily had in, uh, in class um, online using just the ordinary B courses tool. And it was sort of beautiful because I saw many students participating in ways that they hadn't been able to participate in this synchronous vocal environment. Um, and it, it, so just even thinking about resilience, I, if I can use that opportunistically, right, to think about opening uh, forms of access. I just wanted to say, in response to your question, is maybe one mental exercise that I'm trying to use more and more, and I'm, I'm failing all the time. Like, I, I'm, I'm set up to fail a little bit, right? Um, but I want to ask, what am, what am I doing? What is this class really supposed to be doing? What kind of capacities, if I'm going to use that term at all, what kind of capacities do I want this class to be bringing, um, or to, to my students to be developing in the context of the class. In which capacities am I not in the business of policing, right? Mm -hmm. And I do think that sometimes I even feel the temptation as an institutional agent mm -hmm. to, to track and, and train my students to behave a, you know, a particular way until I remember that actually it's not, that's not my job, you know? Um, and I think some of the standard syllabi mm -hmm. seem to follow that basic framework of like these are your con these are your rules for conduct mm -hmm. and you're going to learn how to be a citizen somehow like right but it's like no actually that's not that's not my job so then that may allow me to release some of the requirements into other possibilities but like i said i'm failing all the time you know i have something to say about the the resilience email um it's easy from the perspective of at least the humanities and the social sciences to have a, an eyebrow raised immediately when the resilience word is spoken. Um, when I read it most generously, I was interested in the emphasis on disability access in that email. It was strong. And I do think that many of the ad hoc efforts that we're going to be doing as we go forward 
I don't know about you, but I can't remember a semester in the recent past that wasn't seriously disrupted one way or the other. And it's only going to increase. And many of the ad hoc solutions that people find are not going to be particularly attentive to disability issues unless they make a point of being so. And it interested me in our last power outage um, how some of the most creative and effective solutions that were going on were being organized by disabled, poor disabled people of color. And I was a little bit involved in the, in the margins of that, doing some research, drawing on Karen's <laughs> Disability Lab's amazing work on um, how, how people could get power to live when, when their lives depend on electric power. Um, of course, big surprise, many of the solutions that are out there are being practiced right down there, for instance, on the marina by people who are unhoused and who use CPAPs and use electric wheelchairs. And, and disabled people are resources. They, disabled people have knowledge that this campus needs, that the world needs. And uh, for me, that's the, uh, the big point. Is um, so. So that email for me, there was a, to the extent that it was inviting people. Oh, wait a minute! Think about how everybody's going to get access. If you if you go digitally, if you're going to meet virtually, who are the actual people in your class, and what do they need? Um, I took that in a wholly positive way. Ella's back. Do you want to say anything more on this subject? <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. I was I was also trying to be in a in a meeting with people in my position on all the campuses today, um, <coughs> talking a, a, in part about this issue, about emergency um, preparation and emergency response to support people with disabilities. Um, and finding you know, that, as, as usual, um, Berkeley is really learning as it goes, and yet is ahead of all the other campuses, which is disconcerting. You know, <laughs> you, know you go and you're like, okay, great, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna hear all sorts of like great structures are in place that I can benefit from, and no, no. Um, so, you know, I think it was we really had to um, we had to push strongly to make sure that the interests of the disabled community were understood and incorporated into responses into messaging into planning um, the first round last month did not go particularly well and then um, the second round went much better but dissemination and making sure that everyone was getting it required turning to um, <coughs> cultural community organizations on campus and off to some extent um, in order to make sure that everyone was being reached there was um, a focus and understanding that the students who live here depend on us completely because they can't go home anywhere else right so that was more easily understood and addressed, but how it impacted everyone else that relies on campus for a range of services um, and things that they don't necessarily just have because they can go home. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who can't go home. They don't have a home to go to, and so what do we do for those folks? You know, there, was a, there was a lot of that that didn't get addressed until the second round, and I'm still not perfectly so, obviously. I think we're right at two. Um, okay. Quick question? Or, no. Okay. Uh, if, if you have questions, um, what, what's our best mechanism for responding? Are you all willing to stay around for a few minutes? Sure. I'm going to teach. Okay. So some of, some the of us can stay. We'll stay around if you want to talk afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.